Good morning. Thank you for joining me for morning devotional today. I hope you've had your coffee and maybe a bagel. Um, it's going to be an exciting day today. We're going to be going through the book of Revelation chapter 12. We've gone through 11 chapters already. And this, this so we're, we're now crossing the halfway mark. And if you're interested in another study, I plan on doing another book of the Bible. And if there's something specific, specific that you would, um, you're interested in, let me know. And we can go through that together. Um, I told, I was telling Ashley last night that I think it would be really cool if we could, uh, go through every single book of the Bible chapter by chapter. That'd be a fun thing to have as a resource. So I hope that you've really enjoyed these and I'm excited about today. We're about to get into a little bit of conflict. Um, there's seven characters that we're going to be talking about through it. Um, and we're going to get into who those characters are, what the conflict is, and it's a very interesting story. And this this whole book of the Bible has been a very interesting story. But go ahead, let's let's turn to Revelation chapter twelve. Here we go. Now, before we jump into Revelation twelve and one, I wanted to introduce to you seven characters uh, that are found throughout the book of Revelation chapter twelve through fourteen. Um, these are seven characters that we're going to find all throughout this tribulation period, there are uh, the woman, which represents Israel, the dragon, which represents Satan, the man child, which refers to Jesus Christ, Michael, which represents the angels, um, Israel, which represents the remnant of the seed of the woman, the beast out of the sea is a world dictator, and the beast out of the earth is a false prophet and the religious leaders of the world. And so those are seven people that you're going to need to keep in mind or seven things. Anytime you're reading a story, you know that the characters are important. And so you want to know who they are, what they represent, who they refer to. And so this is kind of a guide. Um, feel free to screenshot this or take a picture of it. That way you can reference who they are and what they represent uh, moving forward. So now let's get into Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now, this is very interesting because it used the word great in front of wonder. The Bible, uh, book of Revelation talks about other wonders, but this is a great wonder. Great wonder in heaven. So it's extra significant. Um, a woman. Now, a woman, the woman, as we mentioned, uh, is a representation of Israel the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, um, a woman, Israel clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now these 12 stars is the 12 tribes of Israel. It represents the 12 tribes of Israel and verse two. And she being with child cried, travaileth in birth and pained to be delivered. Uh, so, through this sign there in heaven, this is, this is a scene in heaven. It apparently portrays a reality on the earth. The woman is persecuted by Satan in this great tribulation. The woman is pictured clothed with the sun, having the moon under her feet. On her head was a crown of 12 stars. She's also with child and waiting for the imminent birth of her son. The sun, the moon, the 12 stars really are help us identify it as Israel. These are symbols that have already been used to describe Israel in the book of Genesis chapter 37 uh, verses 9 through 11 in a, in, um, excuse me, in Joseph's dream. Let me show you those. Okay. So in, here's Joseph's dream and he dreamed yet another dream. This is Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. You know, remember we talked about how new Testament, old Testament parallel many times. He dreamed another dream and told to his brethren and said, behold, I had a dream and dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made, uh, or bowed down obedience to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said, what is the dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, this is, this is Israel here speaking, um, Jacob or Israel, shall I and thy mother, mother being the wife of um, Israel, and thy brethren the, who became the 12 tribes, the 12 leaders of uh, the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, uh, and thy brethren indeed come and bow ourselves down to thee in the earth. And his brothers envied him and his father's father observed these sayings. So here we have the interpretation of the dream. We can, that's how we know 
what they represent in chapter 12. And she was with child and cried and travailed at the birth and pained in delivery. Um, so this is the identification of the woman, which is fulfilling the, the, the covenant of Abraham. Uh, the woman of the nation of Israel is seen travailing in birth and awaiting to deliver a child. Though historically the nation gave birth to Christ through the Virgin Mary, the implication here in verse two is a reference to those that are um, in the sufferance of Israel as a nation made up to include uh, what Daniel, what the visions that Daniel saw. So this is kind of a culmination of that. Um, another proof of the woman's identity being Israel is found in persecution, flight, and protection, and the protection of the woman. After the delivering of the man child, she flees into the wilderness. Um, Mary fleed into Egypt after Jesus was born to prepare a place where she is taken care of for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Uh, the wilderness has a particular reference to Israel in her national history. Um, Israel was taken into the wilderness, into the land of Egypt. Israel since refused to follow God into the promised land, was turned back into the wilderness for 40 years. Israel's unbelief called Ezekiel to declare his purpose. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and they will plead with you face to face. Um, so all throughout Israel's history, there has been a wilderness. Um, there has been a, um, a place where she travailed. There's been a place where she's had to go and seek God. Um, so here we have, she's with child, crying, travailing in birth, pained in the delivery. So that's how we know that this woman is, uh, the, is the people of Israel. Now verse 3. And there appeared an, another wonder in the heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them down into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So John sees a dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head from a similar depiction given in chapter 13, which we'll get into. And then whenever you can parallel this to Daniel chapter 7, it's very clear that um, the revived Roman Empire is in view. Satan, however, is also called the dragon later in verse 9 of this chapter, and it's clear that the dragon is both the empire and representation of a very satanic power. Um, the dragon is seen awaiting the birth of a child with the attempt to destroy it as soon as it's born. The illusion here is unmistakable to the circumstances that surround Christ in Bethlehem. See, the dragon referring to the Roman Empire at the time as a, a dominated by Satan to destroy the baby Jesus. You see, whenever Jesus was born, they, uh, Herod, who basically worked for the Roman Empire, he, um, he had all the babies to and under killed in hope to kill Jesus as well. But Jesus was able to escape. He was there waiting um, to do it because remember the wise men came to Herod's um, thrones and he said who do you seek he said we see Jesus the king born of the Jews and they said oh whenever you find him come back tell us so I can go worship him as well he didn't have the attempt to worship he, he wanted to kill this baby and so this is an incredible parallel of the great dragon Satan uh, desiring to devour the child as soon as it was born it's significant that Herod um, was a descendant of Esau. Think about that. And the people who were traditional enemies of Jacob and his descendants. Now, the desire of Satan to destroy the Redeemer as seen in his effort to destroy Israel is not limited to any certain time. However, the intensity of his efforts comes to a climax in um, the tribulation. In other words, he... See, um, in other words, he has tried this multiple times and he will continue to try this. This is nothing new for him. I'm going to try to get that glare out of there. There we go. Perfect. 
he's tried this before. Now, verse five. So that is who the great red dragon is. Now, as tells a third part of the stars of heaven, um, one third of the angels fell from heaven with him whenever he attempted to overthrow God in heaven. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning. One third of the angels ended up going with him and cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered to devour her child. So Satan was in the earth, ready to devour the child, which was representation of Jesus Christ. Verse five, and she, the woman, brought forth a man child, Jesus Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Caught up, caught up, ascension of Jesus Christ. This man child is the Lord Jesus. He's described as destined to rule the nation with a rod of iron. The Greek word for rule means tend as a sheep. Uh, this could only be true of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though there's others who rule with him. He alone has the authority to be the shepherd and to rule and to reign. Um, uh, Psalms 2 and 9 is a very interesting verse about this. It says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is a prophecy concerning Jesus. Um, Revelation 19 kind of gets even further into this when it says, And out of his mouth goes the sharp sword that it should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. So the man child is Christ Jesus, verse five. Now verse six, six through uh, says, and the woman fled into the wilderness. Mary brought Jesus into the wilderness. Um, and the, the children of Israel will flee into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. There she should, that they should feed her there a thousand and two and three score days. So she's going to flee into the wilderness. If she's going to flee to look for a place, God's going to take care of her. Um, and there was war in heaven. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against the angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this war in heaven will be the last desperate struggle between spirit beings in the heavenlies for and against the majesty of, and kingdom of God. Now you might be wondering why in the world is Satan in heaven at this point? Why, why is he uh, there again? You see, here's the thing. You can find multiple times in scripture where Satan has approached the throne of God. Uh, with Job, he said, he, Job and God had a conversation concerning you. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Well, that's very good. Um, Jesus told Peter that Satan hath desired or asked permission to devour him. You see, I believe that God, that Satan cannot do anything in earth without asking permission from God to do it uh, because God is sovereign and all things are under his control. So having Satan at the throne room of God, God at this point is not a stretch at all because he has to approach God to, uh, to seek permission to go into a window or an open door in someone's life. Now, the reason why that God allows Satan to do things in the earth is to bring us to a place of repentance. God, because God wants to bring us to a place of repentance, he allows things to happen in our lives. That way we are drawn closer to him. So, he was cast out, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. So this, this war in heaven is the last struggle between spirit beings in the heavenlies for and against the majesty of the kingdom of God. It will, uh, it will come to a climax of a struggle in heaven. It first began when Lucifer attempted to exalt himself um, above above the angels of God, dethrone God from the universal kingdom over all the kingdoms of the universe. Although deprived of his kingdom and, and exalted position, he was not deprived of the power in the heavenlies and over the earth. Uh, 
he still has access to heaven and accuse the saints before God. He is an accuser of the brethren. He constantly accuses. However, after this conflict, he will no longer have access to that position. The result of the battle will be the devil and his angels will be thrust to earth, never to have access in heaven again. Through this war, and though this war and other events, this chapter deals with the end of the age. It's clear that they do not come chronologically after the seventh trumpet because the fall of Satan may be predated to the time of the seals in chapter six. Now, let's look at verses 10 through 12. It says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation. So this war is over. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ and the accuser of the brethren is cast down. He cannot accuse us anymore, which accused them before our God day and night. So he had a place of accusation and they overcame him. This is what brought um, deliverance by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did on the cross and by the word of their testimony, the grace and the mercy of Christ. And they loved not their lives unto death. Um, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down to you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So now there's this voice in heaven saying, hey, he cannot accuse you here anymore, but he is now in your dominion and he knows that his time is very short. And when the dragon saw that he was cast down, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now this is a representation of, of, uh, of Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she nourished for a time and times and half times. Uh, this is that three and a half year period that Daniel saw uh, and from the face of the serpent. So she was given two wings and a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Um, now, some believe I read a very interesting piece on this where some believe that the the nation, because since she is a nation, the nation that would be her two wings of the great eagle would, some believe that it is the United States in prophecy. I don't know this, but I, felt, I thought it was a very interesting perspective. Two wings of a great eagle protecting. Now the United States has always been great friends with Israel and has always fought for Israel. Um, whenever the U they have vetoed many things in the United Nation that would harm Israel. And so it's always been a great friendship there. So they're saying that, so people who are much more skilled in prophecy than I say that that is um, where that comes from. Uh, and the serpent, verse 15, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away in the flood so he constantly, constantly, and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have the serpent making a last ditch effort to um to come after this woman this or to, uh, af after this nation and it says that f a flood coming out of his mouth it's it's this is the and then he goes after the per uh the persecution of the godly remnant of israel this immediate aftermath um is The flood cast after Israel is the total effort of Satan terminate, uh, to terminate to, or to exterminate uh, the nation. And the resistance of earth is the natural difficulty in executing such the massive program. Uh, the nature of the terrain in the Middle East, including many areas are not heavily populated, provides countless places of refuge for a, for a fleeing people. Whether the exact meaning of these two verses can be determined with certainty, the 
implication is that Satan strives with all his power to persecute and exterminate the people of Israel. But by divine intervention, both natural and supernatural means are used to circumvent the program and carry a remnant of Israel to safety uh, through their time of great tribulation. And then in the last verse of chapter 12, it states that the dragon is especially angry with those within the nation of Israel who have kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And while the program and the, and the intent of Satan is against the Jewish race, as such anti-Semitism uh, as a whole will reach a peak during this period. And so that is kind of an overview of chapter 12 and what it does whenever you take it as a whole. Chapter 12 is a very fitting introduction to the revelation given in chapter 13 because it introduces the principal actors. Basically what chapter 12 does is introduce you to the characters, um, Israel, Satan, Christ, the archangel, the godly remnant, uh, figure largely into the closing scene of this age. And the next two principal actors are introduced, the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth, the human instruments which Satan uses to um, kind of push his last ditch agenda. So that's kind of where we're sitting uh, through chapter 12. Hope that you enjoyed it. And um, let me pray for you real fast before we go. Jesus, we thank you so much for giving us your word. Thank you for revealing uh, things to us. Thank you for giving this revelation to us of you. May we take it and use it to be able to, number one, ask forgiveness as the accuser of the brethren stands before you today and accuses us of things. We pray that we will overcome him by your blood and by the word of our testimony. Let it be done this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.